All right, Genesis chapter 13 this morning. I was, uh, I don't know about you, I have absolutely thoroughly enjoyed and been reminded on Brother Rich's messages on humility. They have they've really ministered to my heart personally. And it is a characteristic that uh, seems to be lacking in our society today. Amen? And uh, so naturally when he brought up the story of Lot and Abraham, the Lord was so good, I, I, I kind of went back and I reviewed some things about Lot and Abraham and I've always just loved those stories right in there, Genesis 12, 13, 14, all the way up through. And, and so I started studying again some old thoughts on the story of Lot and Abraham, and God was really nice. He did not switch it all up on me this week. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13. There will be a little bit of everything in the chapter. Now, I'm going to give you a little uh, Bible lesson that was taught me years ago, and it's always very much helped me in my study of the Word of God, and that is this. Number one, there will be three things that are always apparent in every passage. The first one is, every story is historically accurate. Amen? The Bible is not a fairy tale. The Bible is not fables. The Bible is not made-up stories. Everything that you read in Scripture has taken place exactly as God has said. Whether man can figure that out or not is irrelevant. I don't know why men think they can look back over 6,000 years, dig something out of the dirt, and then determine that God didn't say something the way it had happened. Amen? It just doesn't make sense to me. Number two, almost passages almost exclusively will have one doctrinal, hear me now, one doctrinal application. That's how you keep from getting confused in your Bible. We call that rightly dividing here at uh, our church. We happen to be dispensational. That is, we believe that God has worked in his authority and his administrations in different ways at different times. However, let me make something clear. Overriding all of that is always this. All men everywhere at all times have been saved by faith in what God has required. Amen? Number three. You may then sometimes take some liberties and do what we call spiritual application, and that is where a passage may not fit for us specifically in a doctrinal sense, but a passage will fit for us in terms of I can glean things either from the lives of the people in the story, maybe the decisions that they made, maybe how they arrived at those decisions, and then I can implement those in my life in a spiritual sense, amen, so that my life is in agreement with God's word and it works better. And so we'll have probably some aspect of all three of those this morning. So let's start in Genesis chapter 13. And before we do, let's ask God to bless. Amen? Lord, we thank you this morning how great you are. Thank you for delivering us from our sin and our ugliness and our filth and, oh Lord, just all the things that we all know about ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy, your grace, your kindness. Thank you for making us new creatures this morning. Thank you for giving us lives that matter, lives with purpose, lives that have now the opportunity to glorify you. And so this morning, uh, we'd like to learn more on how to do that, so we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would enable our hearts to receive the word. We pray you would hold at bay our enemy. We pray that the word would not be stolen this morning from our hearts. We pray that he would not be accusing of the brethren, but Lord, that we would revel and rejoice in the power and the blood and the glories of your Son, Jesus Christ. Fill us now, we pray. May you receive all the honor and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And God's people said? Amen. 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 All right. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, I'm going to kind of verse by verse it this morning. And so, uh, years ago, I was really blessed. Somebody told me that every word in the Bible matters. I'm going to say that again. Every word in the Bible matters. Nothing that you have in your Bible is an accident. Amen? And sometimes we gloss over things. I used to do that. I'd like read over it to try to get the gist of it, and I'd miss all the details. Verse 1, and Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Now that into the south is into the southern part of Israel. And Abram was very rich in cattle and in silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the what? Yeah, at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai. Now, Bethel in your Bible means house of God, and Ai means destruction. 
Isn't that just like all of us? We're all resting somewhere between the house of the Lord and possible destruction, amen. That's where we rest. And so what's God's desire? God's desire that he would unfold his word to you and I, that we need not end up in destruction. Maybe you don't remember the story of Ai, but that was the second city that Israel was to conquer after taking the promised land. They had come into Jericho, and they had won that battle pretty pretty easily, but there was someone in the tribe who took what they weren't supposed to because God had wanted the first fruits of Jericho to be given to him. And so this person didn't obey the word. And if you remember, Israel sent men up to Ai in the book of Joshua, and 6,000 men died at the hand of someone's sin. Amen. And so Ai is called the place of destruction. And so then we go farther. Watch. He says this. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the what? Yeah, at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. All right, let's start right there. Number one, he went up out of Egypt. Now, In your Bible, this is really fascinating. Flip back to Genesis chapter 12 real quick. Let me show you something. Okay, y'all remember the story, right? Abram is over in Ur of the Chaldees. That is, he's on the other side of the desert. And God has come to him. Remember, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't even a Jew. He was a man who lived in the area of what we would call Babylon. And God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, hey, I want to take you over and show you a land that I want to give you because I want to form a nation, the nation of Israel. Now, he was supposed to go alone, amen? Everybody remember that? But his father-in-law goes with him. That cost him a 75-year hiatus. And then he brings his brother-in-law and he brings some other things. He does like a lot of us. We just can't bring it to ourselves to do exactly what the Lord says. So we think, well, maybe there's some gray in there. (laughs) Anybody else live in the gray every now and then? Every minute? Okay, good. Right, that's like the new favorite color in America. Have you noticed that in the new houses? Go on HGTV or Pinterest. Gray is wonderful. So that's kind of describes a lot of things. I won't go there. Okay, stop, Wade. Stop. Focus and concentrate your ADD. All right, here we go. There was a famine in the land. Verse 10. Now watch. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went where? Down. Okay, hear me now. Listen. Is up the same as down? No, it's not the same as down. In your Bible, Egypt is a type of the world. If I listen now, this is very important. Over and over in the Bible, God would get so irritated with Israel because Israel would turn to Egypt for deliverance. Now, picture yourself, you're Abraham. By faith, you've been called out. And by faith, you travel 600 to 1,000 miles to some place you know nothing about. You come into the land of Canaan. You build yourself a tent. You build yourself an altar. And as soon as you get there, not only are there giants in the land, but now there's an immediate famine, a desolate famine. Anybody besides me would say, I wonder if I read the will of the Lord correctly. Amen? So what's Abram do? The Bible says in verse chapter 10, verse 10, he says, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into where? Egypt. Egypt. To sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, I want to say something about this. I want you to understand that you will not, if this is a Bible principle, okay? Bible principle. If you have a triumph in your spiritual life, please brace yourself. Testing is coming. I want to say it again. If you have a spiritual victory in your life, For most of it, it happened not very long after we got saved, amen? Boy, it was all good, everything was going along great, and then all of a sudden, here comes the conflict. Here comes something that would challenge us. I want you to understand this morning that if you're going to grow in the school of faith, God's going to try you in three ways. Number one, circumstances. You will get a test on circumstances. Number two, you're going to get a test on people. Number three, you're going to test on things. And all three of those are going to show up in the chapter. And so here's Abram, and he gets to the promised Lord, he gets to Canaan. He's exactly where God has asked him to be. He is set up exactly as he's supposed to be. And in a moment of time, there's a famine in the land, and it rocks his world, and he does what so many of us have done. He makes the decision, I will go to that which seems like it should be logical to deliver me. And he goes to the world. He goes down to Egypt, and he sojourns there for a little while. 
I want you to notice in verse thir- chapter 13, verse 1, it says this. And Abram went where? Up. See, what's beautiful about this chapter and the very first part is how to get into right standing with God when you have gotten yourself out of it. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you got saved and you've been walking Jesus' way every single day and you have never messed up. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're one of those people, you should be here teaching and certainly not me. Amen. But I'm not that guy. I'm more like Peter. Run my mouth, think about it later. I can be a little impetuous. I'm the guy that can, what was it they used to say, charge hell with a squirt gun or something like that, right? Now, why do I bring that up? Because Abraham is called the father of faith. He is, he's called the friend of God. I mean, if there's anybody in the Bible we look to to understand faith, we look to Abram, who becomes Abraham. And yet he still had his struggles, didn't he? He still had his moments when he turned to something that was not his true deliverer of the Lord. He might have turned to the world, or he would scheme, or maybe he would make a change. Can I say something to you? When you start to waver in your faith, fear will take over. At least that's how it's worked in my life. And when we get fearful, we panic. We start to look for other options because we're just not certain that God's going to come through and deliver. Anybody besides me ever been there? Sure, let's be honest this morning. All of us have had that moment in our life, that one time, if it's only been one, where you said, I'm just not sure God heard me. Is he even on my side through this difficulty that I'm going through? Yes, he's on your side. Amen. He's absolutely on your side. Because 1 Peter tells us that the trial of our faith is to bring about precious results like silver refined in a fire like gold. God must test your faith, not so that he would know it's real, so that you would know it's real. God already knows it's real. Because he's going to forgive you. I love that our God's a God of restoration, don't you? Ha! Man, I'll tell you what, that's the best thing is salvation is eternal. I don't know about you. I don't understand these people don't believe in eternal security. If I called on Jesus and it was a question mark, we all know there's no point in church, amen? Do you understand that this morning? I mean that. I want you to understand that this morning. If you call on the name of the Lord and you have received the salvation of Jesus Christ, you understand if there's any possible way for you to lose it, we're wasting our time. Because that would mean you hold in your hands the power of salvation instead of the God Almighty who gave it to you. Hallelujah this morning. And so we have a couple of things here. So here's what I want you to say. Turn to 1 John with me for a second. So here's what Abram does. Abram's down in Egypt and finally realizes, man, i got to get back home. i got to get back to what matters. Go to 1 John if you would. Now, I am an expert at this. And you'll get that in about two seconds when we read the verse. And I know that I always have to have a baseball analogy for you guys. But you know, you learn a lot of things in athletics, believe it or not. You learn a lot of things in life. And I want to say something this morning. The best thing you can do in your life is realize you're going to make mistakes, you're going to continue to make mistakes, but you can't let mistakes stop your forward progress. you got to forget what's behind, and you got to reach forth to that which is ahead, and you got to press for the mark. Amen? There's no quitters. There's no quitting. The Bible says it this way. You don't get a discharge from this war, amen, in Ecclesiastes. Now I want you to look at the, what it says in 1 John, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 9. Ready? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our what? And to what? Cleanse us from all righteousness. I want you to hear me this morning. Is that a truth or is that a, just a possibility? Is it a truth or a possibility? Okay, listen to me this morning. 
if we confess our sins, he is just and righteous to cleanse us from that sin and to give us all unrighteousness and wipe it away that we might be the righteousness of Christ. Do you understand this morning? Your job is not to live in your sin and wonder. Your job is to get over your sin, confess your sin, repent of your sin, and turn your heart back to your altar, the cross of Calvary, and come back to Jesus and start walking your walk again. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's go. Why do I say that? Because too many of us wallow in our sin and never go on with Christ and become what we're supposed to be. And how do I know that? Because I've had to do that verse I don't know how many times. But it's more important for you. Listen, Abram was going nowhere with God. He was in Egypt and finally woke up and smelled the coffee and said, hey, I got to get back up there where I started, where God told me to be. You know where God's called us to be? At the foot of the cross. And when you don't do right, when you sin, when you struggle, when you don't think right, when you make a mistake, when you mess up, when you watch something you shouldn't watch, when you say something you shouldn't say, when you spend your money on something you shouldn't have spent it on, our job is to go right back to Calvary, get down on our knees and say, Lord, I am so sorry I messed up. Will, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I repent of that. I ask you to will work in my heart. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb so that I can get back on track to you and get back to my altar. Hallelujah. Why do I say that? I don't know about y'all, but the temptations today are unfathomable. I am so dark. It's dark. Everywhere you go, you're defiled. And you need to know this verse. What does he say after that? And hereby we know that we know him. What? If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby we know that we are in him. What I want you to understand is, when you repent, did you notice that he said he'd cleanse us from unrighteousness? See, the natural response, if you meet it in your heart, is that you want to live right. Is everybody with me on that? Like, this is how I know when I don't really mean it. I keep wanting to do it. I keep going back to the well. I'm like the pig back to the mire. Anybody besides me ever do that? Yeah, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry. And what do I do? About a week later, I'm back. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not that great. So I have to remember John, 1 John 1, 9. You know what? Because God didn't put a caveat on there. Well, you're only allowed four requests, Wade. <laughs> you're only allowed to ask five times, and then I get tired of cleaning you up. Praise the Lord. The blood of Christ is not no restraint. There's no, there, there, there's no limit to how many times the blood of Christ will cleanse you from your unrighteousness. Amen. I learned that lesson when I used to preach in the prisons. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't figure it out. You know, I'd be like, I don't understand. I, I've seen this person 22 times here. And I can remember when I first started going, I was a little arrogant about it. Like, I don't get it. Like, how many times do you have to do the same thing over and over and get the same results before you realize it's not working? And I'll, I'll never forget, I was, I was sitting there one day, and I looked up, and this particular person that had been there numerous times was not there. I was like, well, that's interesting. Well, then they weren't there the following week. And they weren't there the following week. And they weren't there the following week. And now she has a home where she takes care of other women who get out of jail, and she helps them walk with Jesus Christ and live their lives. I don't know how many times it took, but aren't you glad this morning that God isn't interested in how long it takes? He's just interested in restoring us. And so this woman got it right. I'm so glad she didn't quit. I'm so glad she didn't stop asking. Aren't you thankful this morning that you can come to God's throne anytime you want to and ask for forgiveness of sin, that you might be restored into the grace of God? Now, hear me out. This is God's method. Ready? Repent, return, rest in him, repeat. Okay? Revelation says it this way. Ah, I love you, but I have somewhat odd against you. You've left your first love. Me. 
Repent and turn back. Repent and get with me. He says to Israel all the time, oh, please come back. Just repent and come back. I'll take you. Amen? But we keep thinking, you know, hear me. I got to say this. But your enemy will think God won't take you. He'll try to convince you that you've asked too many times. He'll try to convince you that God's mad at you and he won't receive what you have to deal with. I just want to say this morning, God is in the business of restoration and God is in the business of grace and God is in the business of mercy. So keep coming to the cross. Amen. Now there's some lessons that I would like to share with you. Go back to Genesis 13 regarding this idea of returning. <clears throat> so where did, where did he go? Well, he went back to his first place. He went back to the place where he had first put his tent and where he had first built an altar and where he had first worshiped, worshiped the Lord. And this is why I mentioned Calvary. Listen. When you come to Jesus Christ, you come to Christ at the foot of the cross. Because it's at Calvary that everything took place to wash away our sin. It's where Christ offered himself to make the payment for our sin. It's where Christ gave of himself that you and I might be redeemed and he made the purchase payment for us. And I just want to say this morning, when you're struggling, when you're not sure what to do, when you don't know where you ought to go, could I suggest to you, you go back to your altar, get down at the foot of the cross and plead the blood of Christ <clears throat> Thank God for your salvation and get back to the basics, amen. And you'll be amazed at how quickly God begins to work in your heart. A couple of lessons I'd like you to know. Triumphs are always tested. Number two, don't run away, don't run away from your tests or your problems. You see, in the school of faith, God isn't like the public school system of America. You don't graduate. So if you run from the problem, you just get a different one. And you're going to have to go through the test again. And sometimes, I don't know if anybody else has ever had this experience. I've run from a few in my life. Can I tell you this? Problem two or three is always worse than problem one. <laughs> Amen? That's one of the benefits of wisdom. You realize, well, I just might till I'll take my spanking now as I take it later. Amen? I might get spanking and grounded. <laughs> right, that's speaking from experience, by the way. Number three, stay where God has placed you until he asks you to move. <clears throat> Let's say that again. Stay where God's placed you until he tells you to move. Why do I say that? Because we're prone to do like Abram, aren't we? We're prone in the midst of our panic, our fear, our struggle, our faith wavering. We're prone to think that if I change everything, everything will get better. Everybody agree with that? And so what happens is if you've really spent time with the Lord and you've spent time in prayer and you're where God wants you to be and you're convinced you're where God wants you to be, remember, all of the things you do in faith are going to be tried. That doesn't mean you move from the place he's positioned you to a new one. Wait till he says it's time to move forward. And so where did Abram go? Back to where he started. Why? Because that's where God told him to be. Number four, I have a little sign from a friend of mine, and I love this. This is great. The will of God will never leave you, lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. I'm going to say that again. The will of God will never lead you where his grace cannot keep you. Amen? If you're where what God has you to be, then just rest there. Just wait there. He's coming. He'll move you in due time. He knows what's going on, amen? He's just maybe moving some pieces for you to get it all taken care of. Well, there was a problem, wasn't there? Let's go to verse 5, and it said, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land, and Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. I want you to notice that Abram got right with God, and Abram was the one to initiate peace. 
Please understand this morning, do not expect the world to make peace with you. Do not expect a lost person to fix something they've done against you. That's an innate Christian characteristic, to think of others more than yourself, to move forward in, this, in the idea of reconciliation and restoration. Those are things that are attributes of the Almighty God who he places in us when we get the Holy Spirit. That is not the attribute of a selfish, worldly, carnal person. Amen. So don't dig your heels in. Sometimes it's better to just mend the fence and move on. Amen. At least make the effort. Anybody besides me ever have a family member you weren't getting along with? Okay, just thought I'd ask that question. Y'all want to come to the altar now or you just want to stay mad at them? How do you want, how do, you want to do that? Now, if they owe you money, I'm not in the middle, okay? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, here we go. Ready? It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If that will take the left hand, verse 9, then I'll go to the right. And if thou depart to the right, then I'll go to the left. Now let's stop for just a second. You understand, when Brother Rich mentioned about meekness, I, I've really been pondering this idea of meekness. You understand that you cannot be meek if you're not right with God. I'm going to say it again. You know why? Because meekness is power under self-control. And when we're in the flesh, when we're carnal, when we're out of the place that God has put us, it is not our nature to maintain self-control. It is our nature to get what we want. And so when you think about this situation with Abram, Abram was not in a position, had he stayed in his flesh, to offer Lot the choice. But Abram, having come back to the altar and having worked with the Lord and gotten some things out of his system and gotten right with God and repented of his hard attitude and his selfishness, Abram was now in a position to say to Lot, you know what, I got enough faith to let God choose for me. Lot, you go ahead and pick and I'll take however this thing shakes out because a little with my God is a lot better than a lot without him. And I believe because Abram had gotten right with God, it put him in the place where he could relinquish this choice to the Lord and get victory over the possession of things. Amen. I mean, let's take a look here. And the Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Not just a few spots. There was water everywhere. Look how it's described. He says, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, now watch, even as the garden of the Lord. Are you kidding me? This thing looked like Eden. Look, like the land of Egypt. As thou comest into Zoar. Now, Zoar is just north of the Salt Sea where the valley is. And Ai and Bethel are kind of like over here. And they're up in the hills. So they're looking down. Now listen. Who wouldn't have picked it? It's green. It's got water. It looks like the Garden of Eden for Pete's sake. Are you kidding me? Of course I want to have a new Rolls. I'm not interested in a Pinto. <laughs> Every one of us is going to be tempted with the niceties of life, with the blessings of life, with that which is better than something else. Where we get into trouble is when we just take it on our own or at the expense of someone else. And so here's Abram, and he says, whoa, look at that. But because he's right with God and because his faith has been strengthened, he's in a position now to say, you know what? I don't trust myself. I've got a 50-50 chance I make the wrong call here. Hey, Lot, you pick. How did Lot pick? With his eyes. And Lot lift up his eyes and looked and said, man, that looks so good. So did Jezebel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
Everyone in this room can testify to having chosen with your eyes, and it ended up not being what you thought you were getting. Because that's how carnal Christians choose. Because we all know what a carnal Christian, right? A carnal Christian, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that's someone who's in, their, in the flesh. They're not walking in the spirit. They're not yielded to the word of God. They're not submitted to the authority of God in their life and then bowing under his authority, believing that his protections and his choices and his leadership and his guidance are premier over what they think. So they begin to trust their own wisdom and understanding and they make a call only to find out it wasn't the right one. So Lot chooses with his eyes. You all know where Lot ends up, right? It, it, it says, and so Lot pitched his tent. Look what it said. And so then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, where God had asked him to be. And Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Notice what he did. He pitched his tent toward where? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know in a couple more chapters we find out that Lot is living in Sodom. You know a chapter after that we find out that Lot is sitting in the gate at Sodom as one of the leaders of Sodom. You know that a little after that we find Lot in a cave in the nations of Moab and Edom, two of Israel's uh, strongest enemies come about because Lot gets drunk. You say, why do I go there? Because it all starts with a look. David said it this way, mine eye affecteth my heart. That's how sin works, right? We're not all, we, none of us starts out going from where Lot was and into Sodom. Nobody does that. Everybody starts out with a little grace to ourselves and we let it go. And a little longer, and a little longer, and a little longer. And then if we're not careful, if we don't get back to the altar, if we don't repent, we wake up there. Amen? Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Come on, that's how we all got there. Everybody here today can say, my sin started out, it was a little tiny thing, and then before I know it, it reached up and choked me. Amen? amen. Aren't you glad God forgave you? Aren't you glad you've been restored and all you got to do is get back to the altar and worship the Lord God Almighty and read the Word of God and get back to prayer and just keep plowing on because Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. And then you won't have to worry about it anymore. One day we're going to be in glory. I hope they have mirrors in heaven because when I look now, I don't really like what's looking back. But when you get to glory, hear me out, hear me out. You're going to look in that mirror in your glorified body with the mind of Christ. You're going to go, dude, I've got it going on today. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's how it's going to be. And then we'll all go, oh, wait, i got to repent of that. It's all about Jesus. Amen. No, all right, I want you to see something. So they separate. I'm going to finish here. Just a little subtle practice here. Second Peter tells you that through the promises of God, hear me now, through the promises of God, we escape the lusts of the world. 2 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 4. Can I encourage you this morning? Know God's promises. Know what the word says you're entitled to. Know what God has given you. Understand that the word is your foundation. Y'all know my testimony. It is what changed my life was when I finally decided this is the final authority in all matters in my life. Now, I don't always do it, but I have never yet backed up on that it is the authority. And if I get anything that is not favorable, it's because Wade messed up, not because God isn't good and loves me. So it says this, and the Lord, now watch, said to Abram after that Lot was what? Separated from him. I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. You will not get revelation through disobedience. God is not interested in talking to you while you're still not ready to be obedient and listen to what God is getting ready to ask you to do. And so what's been the experience in my life, and we see it here because Lot is a type of the things that are going on, 
God has waited until Lot and Abram have separated. You say, wait, I don't understand that. Because at the very beginning, God said, Abram, I want you to go by yourself to Canaan. And he brought Lot with him. And until those two begin to separate and Abram begins to fulfill that which God has asked him to do according to the word of the Lord, then God is going to bring him a new revelation. Amen. It is the most wonderful thing in your life when you have not been where you're supposed to be with the Lord and you repent and get right at the altar and you pick up the word of God and go, Oh my gosh, I have never seen that before. That's just God showing you he loves you, he's faithful. Why? Because he wants to restore you. He's not interested in kicking us in the ditch. He's interested in us being all that we can be in Christ. Amen. Well, let's look at what got revealed. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar to the Lord. Man, that's some good stuff, isn't it? They get separated and the Lord says, okay, now you lift up your eyes. Lot already lifted his. You lift up yours now. Let me show you what I want to give you. It's interesting, isn't it? Lot took, God gives. I kind of look at this as our victory in Christ. When you got saved, God seated you in heavenly places. When you got saved, you were washed in the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit came to indwell you. And God gave you the word of God. And you know what God said to you? He said, hey, do me a favor. I want you to walk the length of it, the breadth of it, the north, the south, the east, the west. He goes, wherever you want to go in what I've given you and just own it all. Take it. It's yours. I've given it unto you. Hallelujah. Do you understand how rich we are today? Do you understand how blessed you are today? Do you understand that you have your right mind today and you know what sex you are today? Amen. Can you imagine being 15 years old and the world is messing with your mind? It's wickedness beyond comprehension because people won't give someone the word of God that they might be set free from their bondage, amen. But you today sit washed in the blood of Christ, freed from your sin, with your mind sound and your life whole and a future to be counted on. Hallelujah, glory to the Lamb, amen. been good. We are rich. Blessed beyond measure. I have to share this because I had never seen it before for years and then a while back I saw it and it just overwhelms me how I know God wrote this book. So this morning, you know, there's two families to Abraham. There's Abraham's children, Israel, And there's Abraham's seed, the church. The Bible tells us that one is called the kingdom of heaven, one is called the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that God has promised Israel earthly blessings and he's promised to us spiritual blessings. Amen? But there would be people today who would maybe say the church has replaced Israel or that God is done with Israel or that Israel has been taken over by the church or whatever that may be. I want to show you this is so cool. I had not ever seen this before. If you look at me at verse 16 and God says this, and I will make thy seed as the what? Dust of the what? Yes. 
I want you to turn over to chapter 15 for just a second. Chapter 15. I'd like you to look with me at verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward where? Oh, that's interesting. And tell the what? If thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, so shall thy what? Okay, wait, 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 wait. Now, is we believe in every word this morning? Okay, did God make a mistake? No. No. So in one passage, God said, I want you to number the dirt. In another passage, he says, I want you to number the stars. Go to chapter 22, verse 17. Because somebody might say, well, Wade, God's just using those as an analogy. It's not like specific. No, here's what I want to suggest to you. Chapter 13, Israel. Chapter 15, the church of the living God. Chapter 22, verse 17, by the way, incidentally, after he offers his son Isaac, type of the Lord Jesus Christ, his greatest moment in faith. Verse 17, he says, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of thy enemies. Woo-hoo-hoo! How good is that? God knew all along. He said, Abraham, look, I'm going to make a people out of you. By the way, Old Testament, let me give you some earthly promises. We're going to call those Israelites. Oh, but I got something working nobody knows about. Now, I'm going to tell you you're going to get the stars of heaven too, but I can't tell everybody that until I bring this guy Paul along. And I got to wait for my son to go to the cross and make a payment. But everybody that will put their faith and trust in what my son does on the cross... I'm going to put in this thing called the church, and I'm going to give them their own special blessings, and they're going to be heavenly. But everybody gets to come from Abraham, the father of faith. So there's no conflict. Amen. Unless you think God was blending the lines, he clearly said, and the stars and the dust. And so there's your dispensational teaching this morning. So we have the historical story that happened. We had lots of spiritual spiritual application, amen? And now you have a little doctrinal so you don't mess up your Bible. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here today and um, you're going, wow. I've been there so many times. I'm there now. I'm not really where I'm supposed to be or... I've let some things into my life that I shouldn't be allowing in my life, or I'm struggling with some things in my life. This is all I want to say this morning. Don't wait. Please don't wait. Right now, right here with God, just repent. Say, Lord, you've been working on me on this for a while, and I just need to get this right with you. And even if I get it wrong tomorrow, i got to start right here. i just got to go. Maybe you're here this morning, and you have never put your faith and trust in Christ. We'd sure love for you to do that. We'd love you to receive the blessings that we enjoy in Jesus. And so you can pray to the Lord right now in your own words and ask him to do that. Repent of your sin and receive Christ. And if you do that, praise the Lord. And if you want to talk to us about it, we'll be up here this morning. We'd love to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ and lead you into his eternal life. And this morning, let us praise the Lord. Father, we thank you. For your goodness, oh Lord, your word is so rich. I pray this morning that it would sink deep into our hearts to let you choose life for us. May you enable our faith to trust your word and to trust you, the faithful God, the holy one, the righteous one, because why? Because it's your character. Thank you for your restoration. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for your power. Lord, you're so good. We love you. We praise you. And we give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.